I mean, I would say what we're seeing is a lot of American companies are front-loading production, meaning that they're actually producing more now before this potential tariff comes into play, this 25% increase in January. So they're front-loading production, trying to import a bit more products than they might usually during this time of the year in order to front-load some of that uh, production in order to you know, just hit that 10% tariff right now instead of the 25% that may be coming. And then what January. will they do at, when they can't do that anymore and the 25% tariff's going to play? They've got to diversify their supply chain. And, and, you know, I think I've been saying this since these China tariffs came to play. They have to diversify outside of China. And even you see a lot of Chinese factories starting to transition facilities outside of China to mm -hmm. the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, India, you know, you name it. A lot of these companies, both American importers, are starting to diversify their supply chain outside of China, as well as Chinese factories also transitioning some facilities outside of China as well. One of the things, Patrick, you point to as a particular danger is, is maybe not so much the effect of the tariffs per se, but that the Chinese will perceive the tariffs as a, as a real threat to their existence, that we mean not merely to level the playing field, but to harm China. If they interpret things that way, what does that mean? Yeah, I think that is a concern because, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> The way that we would like China to interpret some of these trade measures is that they're bargaining chips and they're, they're, they're an effort to get China to compromise on, on some key issues. Um, but the way that it's been interpreted, interpreted by many in China has been that this is simply the U.S. has decided that China is an economic enemy that needs to be taken down. And the Vice, Pre Pre Vice President Pence's uh, speech, although many of the issues that he raised were quite valid. Um, and, and quite real, uh, was taken in China as verification of that, that this was not just things that are being put on the table to be hopefully taken off in a positive resolution, but things that China really, you know, that the hammer was coming down on China and that China needed to go into lockdown and mm -hmm. in many ways go in the opposite so, direction, try to insulate its economy from the U.S. rather than try to open it it's up. It's a very Bannon-esque kind of uh, approach to China, frankly. Dom, go ahead. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Patrick, maybe if I could just follow up on that. If you were to place yourself in the negotiating room, in that, in that, around that table between China and the U.S., what exactly could the U.S. and China come to terms on? How would they find that path forward then to, to, to get rid of this feeling of an existential threat to both of their economies? That, that it really is the, the key to every negotiation, which is what are the practical takeaways? Um, you know, assuming that there is some common ground, what does that look like? Um, and, and this is where we get from the broad issues of things we don't like about China and things that they don't like to be told what to do to the more, you know, concrete issues of what if China were to, for instance, stop uh, engaging in IP theft, or engaging in mandatory technology transfer. What would that practically look like in a way that would make it acceptable for the United States to back away from tariffs? What would the benchmarks be? What would we like to see in terms of path to progress? Because it's not like flipping a light switch. It's not like we're going to get an immediate change. And we've had this discussion, by the way. This is not something new. Back in the 1990s, there was rampant product piracy. It looked different. IP theft looked different in China. But we confronted them on this. Um, and there was a pathway that we agreed on in ways that we would look for practical improvements, and if those practical improvements didn't happen, then the tariffs would go back on. So it, it really is translating these broad demands to very specific demands that could potentially be met. 